Good evening, all. I'm Gracelyn Castle, head of the University of the West Indies Open Campus Site in Montserrat. There is a golden of golden media to whom I pass the baton for the delivery of the Aliagano Festival of the Word since last year, respectfully refers to me as founder of the festival. However, I see the festival as well as the Alphonsus Arrow Castle Memorial Lecture Series as initiatives coming out of the open campus. Nevertheless, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel discussion, which is one of two in this year's lecture series. The lecture series was established in 2010, less than two months after the King of Soka passed on September 15th. It was given the overarching theme of the creative and cultural industries. It was considered the logical thing to do, to have it as part of the literary festival, which is one example of a creative and cultural industry. Since the first symposium in 2010, and this was sponsored by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, there have been several symposia and distinguished lectures allowing for multidisciplinary discussions about the creative and cultural industries. To date, there have been four symposia, six distinguished lectures, and after tonight, three online panel discussions. The inaugural distinguished lecture was presented in 2010 by the late Elizabeth Watson, who was campus librarian at the time at Cave Hill. She presented the family as well as the open campus with copies of her paper. And in fact, in her conclusion, she wrote, Arrow parlayed his inher inherent musical talents and business savoir-faire into multiple revenue international commercial undertaking of no mean order. While he, at sorry about that. While his attractive smile is no more, his writing pen stilled and his voice to a sailor's with new music voice is silenced. Arrow has left a catalog that speaks loudly and clearly of his creativity and contribution to Caribbean's musical heritage. His rich and wonderful trove of Caribbeanness, expressed and represented through his singing, musical accompaniments, recordings, and music videos is a legacy of which Montserrat, the region, and the world must feel extremely proud. Arrow's legacy as a man of the music business in the Caribbean is unparalleled. The responsibility of preserving and protecting his legacy is now the business of others. To those who are so charged, you are implored to take the necessary precautions to ensure that Arrow's music is preserved and protected, always. It is critical that the necessary steps are taken now and in the future to ensure that his legacy remains the property of his heirs and successors. You're also charged to ensure that his music is used only in ways that positively enhances Arrow's image, memory, and legacy. You have been left a task and a privilege that should inspire you for years to come. During this panel discussion this evening, we will be looking at preserving and expanding Arrow's cultural legacy. And in fact, we are looking at this issue of memorializing an icon. Some of the things that have been done to date include um, when he, around the time of his death, tributes poured in, newspaper articles were written. The, as I said just a while ago, the memorial lecture series was established in his name. An exhibition was curated around the time of the first symposium in 2010. And it has been used on several occasions by the National Trust and the Montserrat Museum. The tourism division, in fact, last year included it on its website that it updated. And the exhibition has been mounted for since 2010 on the literary festival website, www.fest.ms. Each year, the family attends mass on the anniversary of his passing. In 2016, he was posthumously awarded the order of national hero by the, the government to Montserrat. In 2020, uh, Basil Morgan joined talk radio in Trinidad to discuss Arrow and his legacy. And there have been other posthumous awards, which I'm sure um, the panelists will mention in their presentations. Without further ado, we are moving into the presentations. Uh, 
I would like to make apologies for one of our panelists who is unable to be with us this evening um, due to ill health, uh, David Edgecombe, which is most unfortunate because m several of Arrow's albums record the input of Radio Antilles in terms of financial support. And I'm sure David could have told us a bit more about that because David worked at Radio Antilles and he was a close friend of Arrow. So we're going to miss his presentation and we wish him well. We hope he gets better quickly. So our first panelist tonight would be Andrew Skerritt. Andrew is a veteran journalist and essayist and he's assistant director for media relations at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida. He's a former journalism professor at FAMU, which is the same Florida A&M University. He holds a bachelor's in journalism from Howard University, a master of liberal arts from Winthrop University, and a master of fine arts in creative nonfiction from the University of Tampa. His essays are nonfiction regarding exile, displacement, and the search for home have been published widely in publications such as the root.com, Tampa Bay Times, Caribbean Quarterly, the Michigan Quarterly, ESPN's The Undefeated, and Miami Herald, and elsewhere. Andrew Skerritt is the author of Ashamed to Die, Shame, Denial, and the AIDS Epidemic in the South, which was published in 2011. This evening, Andrew will speak on Arrow and the enduring power of storytelling. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Grace. It is such a privilege and a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, having to think about Arrow means having to think about my childhood. Having to think about Arrow allows me to sort of use all that I've learned over the last 30 years since I, since I left home and sort of look back and put it into into that context, you know, to the lens of of, of, um, of literature, politics, and all that. And so, it's really an honor to be part of this um, discussion. And and what I, what I wanted to talk about was Arrow and storytelling, because you know it's been almost eleven years since Arrow left us, and it's been six, but it's been six decades since I was first introduced to Arrow's music. His songs are the soundtrack of my island boyhood. They're an anthem of merriment. They're also an encapsulation of island life and the issues that matter to us. Arrow's lyrics and storytelling endure for two foundational reasons. One, vernacular, the other, vision. He spoke in the language of the common man, and he had the genius ability to, help, to tell us how we felt about when our own words failed us. Arrow's lyrics also painted the possibilities of what and who we, we could become. They still do. You know, I've been away from Montreal for nearly 40 years, but Arrow's song catalog remains my internal hymnal. As I, as I prepared for this assignment, the choruses rushed back. The rhythms and lyrics were resurrected. Actually, they never quite left. Some of the songs that immediately came to mind that sort of, for me, highlight the power of Arrow storytelling. I'm, I'm just going to go through a few and sort of look at those songs through to the lens of of um, of being away and having grown and be, being a middle aged man. What what it what they do now mean? Man must live. Who can who can forget that song? You know that was an anthem of perseverance. On our island, survival was basic. Getting through from one day to the next was our primary objective. It would have been sad for our ancestors to have endured all that all that they've gone through for, only for us to surrender. You know, Arrow understood that that would be betraying everything we stood for. Man must live was a rallying cry. Man must live was you know was was that insistence. You know, keep going. It was a it, it was a reminder for all of us that quitting was not an option. When I talk about Arrow and storytelling and language, you know, I also remember the song Hook. And that and that's a fun part about being being on this panel because once I was asked to do this assignment, it just I just went on on this journey backwards. You know, Hook was 1979. I think it was. That was by the way, I could remember the year an Arrow song was released because of where I was in life at the time. 
I remember Hook very fondly. Some Hook on woman, some Hook on man, some Hook on religion. They Hook. I recall that an, an old family friend, Denzel Bam Turret, loved to improvise and add his own lyrics whenever he saw me. You know, Denzel was no poet and he wasn't a singer. Man, he couldn't make a choir. But each time he saw me, he replaced Arrow's words with his own. His version of Hook, including the object of my affection at the time. <laughs> you know, I didn't think much about about Hook at the time. You know, it was it was just a song. You know, ragging was a was a rite of passage. You know, growing up on Montserrat required having a thick skin. But in thinking about Arrow and how he gave lang language for our emotion, it brings me back to Hook. Shakespeare might have called it love or passion. Hook reflected the urgency of our emotional state when we couldn't, when we could often not afford the sentimentality, sentimentality of love. Economics was always more important than emotions. Women, uh, once that women, as we all know, always vastly outnumbered men. And they often had to make economic choices about their partners. Who could support them and their children? Who was on the island? Who was not coming back? How, how long could they wait for somebody to come back? That's that, that's the story of love, but you know it's not it's not sentimental. It's real and it's hard. But to be hooked was to be vulnerable. Arrow understood that. It, it being hooked led to irrational behavior, behavior that was too that was often too expensive for us struggling men and women to afford. Arrow understood that all the time. He certainly did. You know. Our early hour was, was the king of political commentary. And, and, and with all the fun dance music that he produced in the later years, we can't ever forget where it started. PDP, PDP, to hell with the Labour Party. Willie Bum Bum, you did your best. It's time to take a rest. Make way for the powerhouse party. That's Arrow commenting on the generational change when Austin Bramble succeeded his father. Um, you know, my grandfather was a laborite. He he he, he supported Willie Bramble and and uh, Michael Dyer and those folks. And and he didn't he you know he he didn't enjoy the change. But Arrow had a way of telling us it was okay. It was time to change, and he made change all right. And who can remember? Who can forget people going up to that house on the hill sw sweeping with brooms when, when when there was a clean sweep. Yes, I, I'll never forget, I'll, I'll, yes, that night. You know, um, in a colonial society, the artist learns to protest with his prose. Arrow found a way to edify, edify us while he entertained us. And let's, let's keep talking about social commentary. Some of my panelists may be a little young for this, but who is the lasso man? That song from, from, from 72, 73. For young people of a certain age, we recall the terror of walking the street at night after the murder of a 13-year-old girl in 1972, and then her body was found beneath a sandbox tree. The Arrow, you know, who song, who is the lasso man? Um, you know, the cold cases and all that stuff. You know, he understood our terror, but he found a way to add some levity to that situation. He made us laugh when we prepared to cry. Arrow's lyrics also were about vision, the future, what, what we should prepare for. As a patriot, and Arrow was the ultimate patriot. Let nobody, um, yes, Arrow, Arrow was the biggest patriot, you know, um, once a patriot. As a patriot, Arrow understood the importance of land ownership for people a few generations removed from shadow slavery. A new day is dawning. I am warning you, my friend, hold on to your property and will it to your children. That song was the classic political um, and social comment commentary. It was a time when expatriates were buying some of the most treasured pieces of property on the island. You know, the situation that people grew up with, well, it wasn't always like that. And I understood what it means to be dispossessed. His generation and ours have a chance to undo the damage of the past, and we still do. This is Monset culture, and, and I promise I won't sing. I won't sing. 
but <laughs> I am proud of it forever. Again, just the power of his storytelling. You know, you know, one of the and and, and if anybody is offended by my use of the word colonial, you know, I'm not gonna apologize because I because being away from home, I understand the power that of the colonial mind. It, it's it's you know you've got colonialism and you have racism a cousin, and it shapes you even in ways that you don't realize that you're being shaped and you've got to come away from it to realize just how much you're shaped. And, but part of that is that, you know, being ashamed of, of, of you, of who you are, of the things that you create. And what our reminded us was the, about the musicality and beauty of what we, how we talk, the thing that's all sayings. We spoke, the, we speak the way we do for a reason. It wasn't bad language, Ara reminded us. It was our language. Exactly. To, to condemn our language was to condemn ourselves. To think our language was was inferior was to consider ourselves inferior. Our, one, our storytelling was designed to reverse that. Um, how am I doing with time? Gene Under the Bed, another wonderful story you know our storytelling you know this is the issue of immigration but by the time our was done with us we you know he painted so many pictures that we we didn't we didn't think of the fact that this was about the, the you know and you know no everybody's got their green card everybody's a citizen it's not an issue but in the old days when when the path to citizenship and your green card for caribbean immigrants was tough you know the gene under the bed story was about the, the the desperation of being an illegal immigrant trying to find your an American dream, and worst of all, you want to come home for Christmas, but you can't because if you if you leave America, you can't go back. Arrow understood that. He understood that, and he he was commenting on a serious topic. He enter Arrow entertained us and educated us. He never lectured or scolded us, and and we appreciate that. Our old storytelling captured the life of the average person. By creating Calypso, our produced operas of all our lives broadcast on the radio every day, and especially every November and December. He made our misery manageable and our poverty pal palatable. We had issues, but his music and rhythms made our issues and our challenges more bearable. Our always had an aphorism for whatever ailed us. Man must live. You know, in those three words, more meaningful to those who endure the frustration of being stuck on, on a small island, Arrow answered one of the most profound truisms. No matter what circumstances life threw at you, you got to keep going. You have to keep going. Arrow never missed an opportunity to speak truth to power. But not those truth, truth to power, but truth to the street corner. The song, Caribbean Man, Outs outside woman get all and inside woman a ball. Caribbean men have five women. Some may say, you know, that those lyrics are biographical or self conventional I'm not, you know, you be, you be the judge. But but those lyrics, but all of those lyrics bring to mind a face and a name. As Caribbean men, let's face it, we have all issues. And Arrow did not shy away from um, from, from mentioning them. Arrow was an, a troubadour who validated our experience and our lives. You know, raised, you know, we were raised on the double entendre of the mighty spiral, but our didn't beat around the bush. You know, his topics lended, tended to reflect his, his, you know, his Catholic upbringing and his and the conservative, sexually ambiguous nature of Montserrat society. I say sexually ambiguous because on one hand we were told not to do it, but uh, but all around us was evidence that no one took that advice. Arrow's music exposed that. Arrow asked question repeatedly asked question. He always knew the correct answer. Are you ready to go home? No. <laughs> the answer is always no. Because going home means having to confront realities we would rather ignore or postpone. Going home means having to address circumstances we can't change, but which we could. If the party never ends, the euphoria of the music and the moment never subsides. The enduring power of our storytelling will only fade if we allow it to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. You brought Excellent, back memories. Andrew. Yes. You brought back memories. 
<laughs> I have a question, Andrew. What does PDP stand for? <laughs> the, the Progressive Democratic Party. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and, and that was Austin Bramble's party. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, John Osborne was a member of that party. If, if, was he at, at one point? No, no, well, maybe not. But um, yeah, but it, it was Austin Bramble, Mary Tuitt. I think John Ryan right, uh, was a member of that party as well. Yeah, that yeah but, but, but that, 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 was a, that was in the early 70s. 70s, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was actually his first recorded album, The Mighty Arrow on Target, uh, released in 1971. Yeah, okay. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but again, yeah, but it, it's just amazing how his songs just take us back to, to, to places that we've been. Yeah. Covers history. Yes. Yeah. Now we'll move on to presenter number two, Warren Castle, intellectual property and entertainment law consultant. Warren M. Castle is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, where he obtained a Bachelor of Laws in degree in 1998. In 2003, he graduated from the Golden Gate University in San Francisco, California, with a Master's of Law in Intellectual Property, focusing on entertainment and sports law. He obtained the, his legal education certificate from the Norman Manny Law School in 2000. With his main office in Antigua, he practices in both Montserrat and Antigua and Barbuda in several areas, including constitutional, administ administrative law, commercial law, criminal law, media law, trademarks, entertainment law, and other aspects of intellectual property. This evening, he will be presenting on the topic, King in Perpetuity, Preserving Arrow's Legacy Through Trademarks. Warren, over to you. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, good evening, fellow panelists. Good evening to everyone watching. Uh, Soka King in perpetuity, protecting the legacy through trademarks. Now I've chosen trademarks because we've heard much about copyright over the years. Um, copyright, which of course affords a person limited time to exploit their artistic, musical, dramatic works. But we have not heard much about trademarks and people may be wondering, trademarks and arrow, how does that work? Now, trademark is used to indicate the source of a good or service. It does not describe a good, but it indicates the source of the good. So when one sees the Nike swoosh, for example, one recognizes that the product comes from that reputable company that is known for excellent footwear. It is a trademark that sometimes persuades us to purchase something. When we see the Kellogg stamp or the post stamp on a cereal, we are familiar with the brand in terms of we have bought all the products from that particular company and we are satisfied. I cannot bottle a beverage or no one can bottle a beverage and put the words on it, Coca-Cola. That would of course be misleading because what we are suggesting is that the product comes from that reputable company that we are familiar with. Famous marks include the Coca-Cola, uh, the Nike, Swoosh, Yahoo, and of course the famous Apple. Prior to the use and registration of those marks, one would not think when they hear Apple, you know, you would think about the fruit. But app, Apple has become a, has uh, developed a secondary meaning because of its use with the computer product. When you think of computers and electronics, you think of Apple. When you hear Apple, you think computers and electronics. Uh, same thing with perhaps when you hear Yahoo. I mean, prior to Yahoo using it, uh, probably was an expression of excitement are never linked to a search engine or an information site. Once these marks are registered, you can exploit the mark. The owner that owns a registered trademark has exclusive right to use the mark in a particular class. Our classes include with the clothing, with the music, our provision of our travel services, etc. So what can be registered? A person's likeness and image can be registered. This is one way 
of preserving Arrow's legacy. We have seen Bob Marley's estate do it with Bob Marley t-shirts, Bob Marley mugs, hats, rugs. I've even seen um, a deal that they made concerning the baby bibs that he put on the baby so as not to have them spill on himself or herself. Uh, we see it for paper for rolling tobacco, etc. The difference between a trademark and copyright is that copyright protects the expression of an idea, whether in music, whether in a film, whether in um, dramatic works, artistic works, but for a limited time. The law permits life plus 50 years. This means that 50 years after Arrow's death, the estate can collect royalties from the exploitation of Hot 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 and other musical works. Beyond that 50 years, once that 50 years has elapsed, and I believe so far we have seen 11 years, time flies so quickly. So the estate has 39 years and approximately 38 years, sorry, and approximately nine months um, left to exploit Arrow's work. So there's a limitation on the protection of, of in terms of the duration that you have to uh, have exclusive right to that work in copyright. With trademarks, you can have it in perpetuity. It can be renewed over and over again. In some countries is 10 years, some is 14 years. Once that 10 or 14 years has elapsed, you can re-register or continue to register. So you have exclusive rights. And that is why it will never end in trademarks. And that is why uh, trademarks is another way to preserve his legacy. T-shirts, I believe that we can preserve it with certain marks in particular, um, heart, heart, heart. Ola Soka, phrases like every day should be a holiday, which is the first of line, I believe, in the song Ola Soka. This can be placed on mugs and t-shirts and other merchandise. And some can be even licensed. We can get creative and say, oh, we have a registered trademark now. Let us see who can benefit from this trademark. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is a cruise line as far as the Every day should be a holiday is concerned. Uh, that can be used to license the cruise line, uh, cruise industry, with perhaps just that phrase in a loop, in an ad, or a t shirts for those who are, uh, they could make it a slogan for the cruise line. That's another way of preserving Arrow's legacy. Uh, unless there are particular questions, uh, I think, you know, I don't want to bore you with all the legal. Um, proceedings or procedure, etc. But that is my brief, very brief presentation on how the Soka King can really be in perpetuity uh, for us to register his mark. And when I say us, I mean, us, I mean the SD, the executors, ex exactly, can register the marks and exploit. Yeah. One quick uh, correction there. So the modern law is actually extended to 70 years. Uh, it used to be 50 years, but it's now 70 years. Not in months, right? Sorry. Not yes, for the yes. US. Ah, ah, yes. Yes, yes for the yes, US. Yes, yes, for the US. Yes, yes. And in fact, yes. the reason why it was extended, by the way, is because of, um, um, I guess, people lobby, the people, the Disney company, yes. Disney Muscles, yes. go to the public domain, and um, they actually extended it. You know? Yeah. So we have to wait a long time before we can um, draw Mickey Mouse and use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What, what, and what that's for thank copyright. You. That is for copyright. That's a copyright um, with trademarks. It um, the limited time can renew and it's finished. Okay. Gotcha. You're saying, Grace? Yeah, well, I'm. I'm just thanking you for that presentation, which is the third in this in this lecture series that you've done. You were there for the first symposium and the second. During the first um, symposium, you presented on follow the arrow lessons learned from a Soka King, and um, in 2011 for the second symposium, you were there again, and um, your title was. Is this Arrow's second death? I look at Arrow's music one year later. So um, you are continuing to remind us what needs to be done um, in, the sh in the time that's left. Now, um, I know everybody's been waiting to hear yes. from Arrow's son, um, Sawandi. Right. Sawandi is um, Arrow's <laughs> second son. So Sawandi, I'm going to introduce you and then the floor will be yours. Thank you. Sawandi Castle works as the senior solutions engineer at Udemy Business, which provides solutions for teaching and learning online. 
He is the co-founder, executive director of the Alphonsus Castle Foundation and managing director of Arrow Music Catalog. He was born and raised in St. Lucia and has spent vacations and lived in Montserrat on two separate occasions. He is Arrow's second son and he graduated from the University of Massachusetts in Boston with a double major in operations management and computer information systems. So Wandi, please, we look forward to hearing your presentation on the Alphonsus Castle Foundation. Thank you, thank you, Grace, I uh, appreciate it. And um, also thank you to, uh, to Andrew and uh, Mr. Cassell. Uh, I'll try my best to be as, as eloquent as uh, those gentlemen. <laughs> Um, so let me just, uh, I have a few slides I want to walk through and I want to talk, you know, talk about some of the works we've been doing, uh, for the Alfonso's Cassell Foundation and also just give some quick updates on, uh, our music and, you know, some of the projects we're working on, some of our uh, ongoing initiatives. So let me share my screen here. Ah, actually it's not allowing me to share my screen. I would have to restart, but I'll, I'll, I, we could just, you know, talk through it, have a conversation. So. You know, we've been having conversations, you know, with the family, uh, my siblings, and uh, also uh, most recently with um, uh, Montserrat National Trust around, you know, what can we do as a family in partnership with, whether it's Montserrat National Trust or another foundation into ensuring that the legacy of Alphonsus Cassell, you know, remains, continues, um, and is, um, you know, and is, um, you know, fine-tuned, if you, if you will. And, you know, these are all the conversations we always welcome, um, you know, because we feel the same way, right? So I'll go through, I actually have a really um, beautiful image I would have liked to share, but, um, and I'll, I'll be sure to share it after the fact. So, you know, we'll talk about the foundation, we'll talk about, you know, current state of affairs, our ongoing projects, and then, you know, just some next steps for us. And, and we want, you know, the public, you know, like, you know, if, the public, the folk, people of Montserrat to, to hold us accountable, right? If there, if anyone has ideas or things that you feel that we should be doing, you know, as a family, as a group, as a unit, um, you know, we welcome these ideas. Um, you know, Ira was, you know, if Ira spoke well of, of anything, it was first Montserrat, right? Ira, Ira spoke well of everything, but, you know, his first love was absolutely Montserrat, right? And he took, you know, that message you know, everywhere we went. And um, I mean, you can ask any of my siblings or family members, folks who've worked with him, worked for him. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of stories, you know, and, and it, it's the, the main theme was always Montserrat and his love for Montserrat, right? So whatever we do, we do want input from the people of Montserrat, um, you know, who, who, love Ar who loves Arrow and cherishes his legacy as well. Okay, so so an overview of what is Soka, right? We all know what Soka is, but I want to talk about Soka from Ara's perspective, right? His definition of Soka. So he saw Soka as a marriage of soul and Calypso, right? Fusing uh, the different genres like rock, soul, Calypso, salsa, merengue, dancehall, reggae, and even hip hop, right? So um, Andrew uh, took us back to some of the original Arab songs where it was uh, primarily political, you know, music that. Um, you'd have to be from, you know, from Montserrat to get, you know, the uh, the big message, even though some of that music started to transcend. And, uh, you know, Ira had an epiphany, right? So Ira said, you know, I'm recording these albums and these are fantastic albums. You know, the people love these albums, but, um, you know, being the business savvy person he was, he realized that his return on investment um, was short, right? So he would put, you know, all this effort into an album, but it had a limited audience. It had a limited reach. And he wanted his music to, you know, cross borders, right? He wanted he wanted to have a global, a global audience, right? He was singing music for everyone, right? So from his perspective, he needed to transition from that traditional calypso uh, political views, day to day views of the people, and sing to reach a mass audience, right? So again, fuse, you know, a marriage of soul and calypso music. Right. And uh, so, you know, lots of times we have to describe, you know, explain who is Arrow. Right. So, again, folks in Montserrat, they know who Arrow is, but um, I just want to go through some points here, you know, some highlights of uh, throughout his career. So, you know, electrifying performer. Right. Uh, you know, you, you're at an Arrow show and, I, and I've been to many Arrow shows uh, in the day. And I mean, just, you know, in awe of seeing my father perform. Right. In awe of seeing him sort of transition from dad uh, you know, employer, you know, regular person to just that persona on stage was something that I was always in awe 
of, but also seeing the audience, right? Seeing, you know, people transcend, seeing people sort of in this, you know, in this um, and sort of mesmerized by the sort of electrified atmosphere of the concert, just sort of dancing and almost in a trance to his music and seeing him sort of command attention from the audience. That was something that I was always impressed with and always um, sort of drove me to music, you know, you know, I'm an, a music uh, archivalist myself, and you know, I think it, it absolutely started uh, with my dad, Arrow. So he recorded 34 studio albums, uh, first in 1971, and his final uh, studio album in 2002. Um, some of his first, right? So first soca artist to tour Africa. He performed in Nigeria, South Africa. Uh, first to tour all, all over Europe, um, to tour Japan, and also Latin America. So uh, countries like Colombia, Cuba, Peru, and even Australia, for example, right? He also toured Morocco, for example, right? And uh, in my research on, um, you know, his music and his releases, I'm finding, you know, releases that I didn't know existed, right? So a special release in Peru or Brazil, right? Where the album cover is actually in that native language, right? So it's not in English, it's, you know, it's released in Colombia and it's, you know, the, the writing is in Spanish, for example. So, you know, these are things that, I, that I've learned, you know, within the past, you know, months and years that, you know, to this day is, you know, still, you know, blowing my mind and just, you know, discovering all these new things. First Caribbean artist to release a music video. First Caribbean artist to release music on a compact disc, right? So, you know, as we know, you know, the music was all analog before, all, you know, real tape and uh, live instruments for the most part. Um, but, uh, you know, he was one of the first to actually start, you know, recording music using more, using, you know, technology, right? You know, imp implementing technology not only in his music but it's just in his entire process right so many people uh, don't know that you know after he recorded his albums he would you know seek out the best you know the best professionals to mix and master his albums right so many of his albums were mixed and mastered by the same places where some of the biggest rock and roll art albums in the world were also mixed and mastered by so that he as everyone knows you know he was you know a bit of a perfectionist and he wanted to always put out the best product possible. Um, first soca artist to sell 3 million plus records and have a song performed in 12 plus languages. That's hot, 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 of course. Uh, some other highlights, you know, first to perform in Central Park in New York, uh, Studio 54, Top of the Pops in the UK, first to perform on Soul Train, uh, first to be on the uh, national British charts with Hot, 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 and also with the song Long Time. And uh, first uh, Caribbean artist to perform al alongside um, artists like Sting, Phil Collins, Elton John, and so on and so forth, right? So that, you know, we know who Arrow is. That's some highlights of Arrow. So let's talk about the uh, the foundation. So, I mean, you know, I'm a very transparent uh, person, and I like to be, you know, as honest and direct as possible, right? So, you know, we've been getting feedback, you know, we as the family, right? The, the family, the siblings, you know, of, you know, you know, maintain the estate, main, maintain Arrow's legacy, and so on and so forth. And I mean, it's it goes without saying, right? But we think we can do more, right? Beyond just the music, because the music is out there. If you want to find it, it's available. Anyone can find it digitally in stores, you know, physical or digital copies, right? But we feel like we can do more than just the music, right? So we founded the Enfondas Cassell Foundation, right? So it's a nonprofit organization founded by the founded and an executive directed by uh the alfondas cassell estate heirs and um and currently you know we're working to find partnerships you know like the Montslot national trust uh, we're part we're looking to partner with some of the um you know music companies that uh that arrow has worked with throughout his career right and see you know how they can help and also partner with you know, you know, other nonprofit organizations, right? Like uh, the Rihanna Foundation, for example, which, uh, the Fenty Foundation, or maybe even the, the Warren Castle Foundation, for example. And um, and our mission, you know, the so the Afonis Cassell Foundation is an independent nonprofit organization that focuses on the delivery of social interventions through education, culture, environment, and sustainable community development by reflecting on the core values of Alfondas Cassell. Right. So, you know, we talk to different people, you know, we get so many stories, but some of those same core uh, values of Arrow um, always surface. Right. His business acumen, his attention to detail, his, uh, you know, the importance of education, the importance of uh, progressing and 
bettering yourself, right? And I, I could give you so many stories growing up, right? I think I was probably, uh, you know, nine years old with, uh, it was myself, my dad, Tashimbi, AJ, and, um, you know, he's having me write, you know, to, to write a check, right? To pay a bill for him and to write out the check. So he's teaching us, you know, these things. And, you know, at, at that age, I'm like, why am I writing a check? Why am I paying at t you know, at 11 years old? But I'm learning how to write a check, right? I'm learning how to sign a check. And he's saying, hey, in the memo, put X, you know, this information in the memo. And I'm looking at the shimmy and he gives me a look like, yeah, I've already had that lesson. Like, it's your <laughs> turn now. Right. So it's my turn now. And then, you know, we're looking at AJ, he's a little kid playing on the floor. Right. But, you know, but later on in life, you know, AJ was getting similar lessons, if not the same. And he's looking at us and we're giving him that same expression, like, it's your turn now. Right. So, you know, so we want to do some of those things for, the, you know, the, the youth of Montserrat. Right. And, um, you know, so some of our ongoing projects in development is the Ira Museum. Right. So, it's, uh, you know, so, you know, just let everyone know we are committed and dedicated to um, constructing an Arrow Museum on island. Uh, the location of the museum will be at the Arrow's Man Shop uh, site. And the reason we chose that that location is we want a central place where people could get in and out of easily, whether, you know, uh, visitors coming in, they have to go past it. And then leaving the island, you have to go past it. You could stop by, you know, view an exhibit. Um, you know, buy a t-shirt, you know, like some of the stuff Warren mentioned is trademarking some of the products so you can, you know, you can get some of those same products that Warren mentioned that's long overdue, right? But we also want to, another project is the University of Soka. So what, you know, what is University of Soka? When Ara was around, there was the University of Soka, which was essentially his closest friends, his closest confidants that he, he made music with, right? So he would record a song, he would get advice from, you know, um, you know, he would co-write his songs, you know, with his, his brother, as you know, Justin Hero Castle. And, but he would have, you know, his team, whether it was um, Sargent or, you know, all these other folks, Sapiki, et cetera, all these other folks who gave input uh, on his music, right? He, he wanted to make sure that not only it was, you know, it was accepted in Montserrat, but, you know, beyond the shores of Montserrat. So that's what the original University of Soka is. But in, you know, in this, in this era, we want to, uh, reinvent the University of Soka and uh, offer music education, business and technology skills um, development to the people of Montserrat, right? So the youth of Montserrat. So, and um, you know, I'm in the the, the um, I'm in the my career is in, uh, in is in education and upskilling, and you know, I've seen in my career the the ability to transform people's lives, right? All you need is a laptop and an internet connection, and you can, you know invest in yourself, invest in your learning, your upskilling and um, develop tangible skills, right? Skills that you can take anywhere, right? So, you know, you can become an accountant, you can become a software developer, you can become a data science, right? All you need is a laptop and the internet. And um, and, and we're committed to affording this uh, to the youth of Montserrat, right? So whether it's, you know, uh, partnering with the schools, the schools there, you know, University of West Indies and Graceland, or whoever wants to be involved, but we want to get, you know, access to everyone in Montreal to have the ability to transform their lives and learn new skills, right, the skills of tomorrow, right? So, you know, not to take away from, you know, the traditional skills that are also necessary, but if we want to develop um, Montserrat and if we if we want to maintain the legacy of Arrow, I think part of that also is to um, develop the youth of Montserrat, right? And and then lastly, another project we're working on is just just an archiving everything Arrow from audio, video, print, etc. And uh, and yeah, so you know, just a quick update on Arrow music. Uh, we have a Best of Arrow release uh, coming out in uh, June or July of 2022. Uh, we're going to do some remixes on there. There's one remix that some people may have heard. That uh, feature a remix of Hot 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 featuring Beanie Man. Um, you know, we're also working on some other re uh, remixes. We are, you know, currently working on the rest of the catalog, right? So everything beyond just Hot Hot Hot, like some of those amazing titles that we all know, to you know get, you know, to look for avenues and ways we can exploit um, these titles uh, to tie into what some of what Warren said. And again, you know, any feedback, any concerns, any advice, 
uh, from any listeners, you know, who are interested in preserving and uh, <coughs> pol polishing Ira's legacy, uh, we would welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Suwandi. Thank you. How did I do on time? Most, most interesting. Um, I like the fact that you reflected on um, Aru being a perfectionist. Um, he was focused on improving his product, um, responding to the audience and, and yes. the audience's needs. And in fact, um, I mentioned Elizabeth Watson. When um, I was working as a librarian at Mona in the acquisitions department, I saw a number of books um, about Calypsonians coming through with Elizabeth's name on them. And I looked at them closely and I realized um, she was analyzing their work. And I thought, I'm not in the position to analyze Calypso's. So I ended up speaking to her and she said, you have a, an icon right there in your midst, Arrow. Have a talk with him and see what is possible. Now around the same time I was doing some studies in, I was doing a, a double major, uh, masters, computer studies. I'm no um, computer expert but I understand the language so that I can talk to um, people who are the technical people. And um, I was also doing business studies. That part I enjoyed a lot more. Now, um, I decided to look at Arrow's work in terms of business um, and what he was doing in terms of the music industry. And it was fascinating beyond measure. So I, I thought it was a privilege that I had the opportunity to talk to him in person, on the telephone, by email. I have all these um, old records. And um, in fact, my paper was presented at a conference in Jamaica initially. And then I revisited it for another conference in Barbados, which I was unable to attend, but Elizabeth presented it on my behalf. Now, um, some of the lessons I, I, I take away from Arrow's um, approach to the music industry. There are three things that I really want to stress, and it's his approach to entrepreneurship, the importance he ascribes to reading so as to um, improve understanding of the industry, and his insistence on always surrounding himself with the best. I think these are lessons that um, can guide anyone in, in yes. whatever business you're undertaking. If you want to have a good product, Absolutely. You, you really need to associate with people who understand the business and who can guide you. And in fact, that was the thinking behind the literary festival when we, we brought in um, authors who were at the top of their game so that our aspiring writers in the community would be able to sit at the feet of people who could give them pointers. Um, so, so that was the approach that um, I was using for the Aliogana Literary Festival. First, all you're going to festival of the world from since it started in 2009. Now, um, Elizabeth, um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry that um, she passed, but she, in a recent conversation, um, she would have died, I think, um, two years ago. And two years prior to that, she was suggesting that Arrow's music could become. Um, we could submit it to be considered for the UNESCO Memory of the World um, project. So um, those are some of the things that can be done to memorialize um, an icon. And um, yes. I, I have had a discussion with 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 Sawandi about um, the grave, and he's not um, he's he's not um, you know supportive of the suggestion that the grave could be something that people. Um, may have an interest in. I, I, I see his point of view. I support it, but I'm thinking that one of the things Arrow had um, discussed back in 2000, 2001 was setting up the Arrow website, which I think someone is working on. And I just want to share this um, article from rollingstone.com, which says, um, here's how to visit the final resting places of these 20 music icons from classic rockers to country crooners, find out where you can travel to see the grave sites or memorials to these greats. And basically the article by Chauncey Crail says, musical geniuses, artful songwriters and legendary performers leave indelible marks on history and culture 
and on the lives of fans and listeners, often generations later. The final resting places of these stars and entertainers give fans an opportunity to pay homage to the artists who influenced them. With our collection of publicly viewable grave sites, you can pay your respects to those who influence your musical journey on your next trip. And they list people like Prince and Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Jimi Hendrix, and so on. Now, um, I understand so on this thinking, and I agree with him that um, based on its location, the um, other residents in the area wouldn't be happy with um, say a tour bus turning up in the area. But I'm thinking that um, you can have you can allow the visitors to tour the site online. Um, so I'm, 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 yes. I want to present that as a, a, an idea. Yes. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. And no, I, and I mean, I know, um, sorry, go on. And the more, the more I'm hearing you talk about it and I'm seeing, I'm hearing more pros and, you know, a, a little bit less con. So it's something that we'll, we'll definitely reconsider. Um, maybe, you know, in some sort of limited aspect, for example, um, as opposed to just being open to the public, uh, you know, around the clock. But um, but yeah, it's something that we would definitely re re revisit and uh, and consider. And, and again, I'll keep mentioning this. If there's any entity on Montserrat, you know, i.e. the government of Montserrat, i.e. Bank of Montserrat, that feels um, similarly and is... Um, you know, I would like to, uh, you know, have some form of, uh, you know, cohesive um, engagement around these initiatives. I mean, we are all ears and we, you know, we want to partner with people in uh, different groups on this. So, I mean, I think the time is now. And I, I really like your thrust for um, education. Um, yes. Never wanted to be a teacher, but somehow I've ended up in the in the field. Um, but I recognize the value of education. And yes. one of the things I've been working on recently is um, trying to develop a proposal to get an online education program in the prison. Yes. Because if, if we can equip um, people with the skills they need to make a living, then um, perhaps they need not um, be recidivists. Yes. So um, there are a lot of stumbling blocks right now. Um, yes. A lot of things need ironing out, but yes. if, if it's something you want to consider, you know. Absolutely. So I have actually, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've worked on that use case before. So there's a company called Televered in the U.S., and that's what they do. They work with um, female prisoners who are nearing release and uh, looking to help them with their transition. So they, you know, they afford them with, you know, these tangible skills to, and help them get jobs, right? So it's it's you know it's it's not just the education but sort of the mentorship as well right so walking them through a journey of okay this is where you are today right and this is you know this is your journey to get to where you want to be where you need to be and and, and sort of you know walk working with them every step of the way another example i worked with uh, the bank of egypt and they're realizing where technology is going right so they're thinking of the skills of tomorrow right what you know what skills do they need in their country to help continue to develop their country, right? And they're looking at, okay, we want to experience X percent of growth in these sectors, and but they can they, they can get a sense that we're lacking in these areas. So they're purposefully um, uh, affording scholarships to people, you know, to the youth to develop these skills now. So by the time they're ready, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's talent available to fill these roles and, you know, fill these jobs. And I think that's something that, you know, the government of Montserrat should should absolutely look into. I think that's something, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, the school systems in Montserrat should look into and even the businesses in Montserrat. Right. So, you know, if you want to you know, develop the country and if you want to advance technologically, you need the skills. Right. Um, and their skill. And these are skills that you're not going to learn at a four year college. Right. You're not going to learn to code JavaScript. You're not going to learn Python at at any university, you need to get these type of skills to become a data science, right? You know, to become a data engineer, for example, um, people are learning these skills online and uh, and transforming their lives, transforming their products, their companies, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a matter of providing our youth with opportunities, because what I find is that um, what is sad is that they're using the technology um, in a way that is harmful to them as opposed to, um, you know, you read about these prodigies elsewhere who yeah. at the 
tender age, developed some kind of product and sold it to somebody else and became a, an instant millionaire. Um, yes. I would love to see our youth do that, you know, yes, as opposed absolutely. to um, having some some um, photographs that are detrimental to their yeah, well-being. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. well, 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 you know, um, Grace Arrow had sort of set the, the the bar. He showed people how you could live in Montserrat and have a global life. Correct. And all, y- yes, Absolutely. and and from a technological standpoint, um, things are even more accessible. You know, you could be um, whoever you are in Montserrat and work and get paychecks from somebody in, halfway across the world because of because of the. Yeah. Uh, because it's all digital. And I think that um, our showed us that you can be local and global at the same time. Correct. That, that, that there's no, that, um, that, that, that's possible. There are persons who are. Uh, Warren, are you saying something? Yeah, I was saying, I was supporting what Andrew said. There are persons in the Caribbean who are authors, uh, screenwriters, and silently they're working in the region, but they're doing work um, back perhaps in Canada. There's a friend of mine, for example, uh, who lives in Antigua. He's Antiguan and he does voiceovers. There's a big thing in Canada for the visually impaired. So what he does, you're watching a show and they're watching it. However, they have, you know, the subtitles in terms of persons who can't um, hear. Well, he does the voiceovers and describes what's happening. So if there's a scene and somebody's in his office, says, as a person's walking in, Andrew's in his office, his little nine year child walks up to him, goes up to him, and then it, it is it's run smoothly with the dialogue that's happening in the movie. He does that from here and is well paid for it. Um, well, for a Canadian company, for example. And so there are lots yeah. of things. And then this is where the, the company that Sawandi works for uh, comes in very handy because so many courses, that was for the first time this weekend looking at it, I was with him. And there's so many courses. There's courses on screenwriting. There's courses on, um, on photography. Um, hundreds of courses that people can better themselves and use as a tool and even work from the region, but yet generate income yes. that's direct uh, first world country. But yeah. as, as Andrew said, Arrow did it when we did not have the technology, right? I mean, every five minutes yeah. I was on a plane to New York. Um, I used to actually use him as my courier when he was, um, when I wanted to buy. I remember buying a certain jewelry for Cleo as well, and I would call him back and say, you gave me X amount of dollars, but I see something that's really, really nice, like for an extra 40 US, am I permitted to go ahead and go ahead, you know, and that kind of thing. So it, it was good. And I, I also remember using yeah. him as my um, Western Union, um, when for some reason I had to do something in the UK. Um, I would give him a local check, and then he would transfer it to a particular bank account in the UK, so as to get the work done. Just avoiding Western yeah. Union fees, obviously. So, um, yeah. yeah, but no, it's and a, a little, uh, a little secret to add to that. A lot of that stuff that Ira did for many, many people, it was really um, us doing, you know, running around and getting that stuff done. So, yes, exactly. And in that process, we, I mean, we learned a lot about life, about survival, about, you know, um, working with people about negotiating about um, objection handling right so one the objection handling was a big thing for him um and we see that in you know as, as a salesperson or as a, someone in the business if someone gives you a rejection you have to be able to um you know almost turn it around and still get what you want or you know be able to negotiate um you know to, to uh you know to, to 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 still get your end result so I mean, just so many, so many lessons um, that we've learned. I mean, life lessons at that too. So, yeah, you know, we we, we want to transfer and pass pass on some of that knowledge to others. I, I want to so go back to example. something that um, Andrew mentioned in his presentation about colonialism and the fact that um, we are all shaped by it. And I and I'm saying that to say how we take our for granted. I took Arrow for granted until I started looking at his music um, closely. Um, when I was a student in the UK, um, I joined the Catholic Society and um, ended up going on tours with them. So one of the tours was a riverboat disco down the Thames <laughs> with the priests and nuns. And um, Hot 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 played. And I got really excited. I was running around saying, that's my cousin. <laughs> 
that's my cousin. And um, people were saying, well, yeah, the, the, the nuns were um, limboing through the priest's legs. <laughs> And um, you know, we, we were having fun, and I felt extremely proud yes. um, to be associated yes. with, with Arrow. And um, yes. one of the things that I'm sure um, David would have been able to share with us um, is that the visitors, do you remember, uh, Radio Antilles had a pen pal program, and a lot of the people in the region would come to visit Montserrat simply to visit Radio Antilles, and they always added to meet Arrow. So I had a friend who visited me from Jamaica. And when I asked, you know, what would you like to do? He said he would love to meet Arrow. And um, I called Arrow. I, I thought to myself, oh, I don't want to have to bother him. But he was most gracious about it and invited us over. Um, the chap was thrilled to pieces. Arrow gave him some CDs. And I think that's the only thing he remembers about Montserrat. He was so pleased. <laughs> so in a way, um, we, 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 we don't realize the impact Arrow had on our tourism product here in Montserrat. Um, the fact that people wanted to visit the house and see the pool in the shape of an arrow. Um, the, the shop in town in, in Plymouth, that was another landmark. So um, we, we, as colonial uh, well subjects, we take too many things for granted. We um, don't appreciate what we have. Um, for, for example, uh, Andrew spoke about the fact that our language was condemned, but um, <clears throat> that, that's the whole um, colonial approach to um, affect your self-confidence, I think. Um, in, in, in fact, when I presented that paper in Jamaica, it was because one of the academics made a comment about um, Arrow's music not being sufficiently worthy of academic um, interest. And I'm going to tell you, when I presented, um, there was a, a, a whole group of um, students from the high schools nearby, and they were taking notes. I was really, you know, moved by the fact that these students were taking copious notes about Arrow. Yeah. So um, I think I gave the lie to the, com the, the, the comment made by the academic <laughs> that Arrow um, <laughs> was not sufficiently interesting. Yes, yes. Uh, and Can another thing I find, that? yeah, just so just one more thing to add. I mean, sometimes, you know, you have a rough day. I'm, I'm, not, I'm in, in not, not in the best of moods. Sometimes I find myself going on YouTube, looking up Arrow songs and just reading the comments uh, on YouTube, right? It it's, it's, might be a strange pastime, but I, I get a lot of pleasure in doing that and seeing people from all over the world tell stories, share their stories. I mean, people from Cuba to... Uh, you know, I've seen people from Australia, you know, Netherlands, all over the world telling stories about their experiences with Arrow, them meeting Arrow, them being at an Arrow concert. Um, so, you know, if anybody in Montserrat ever, you know, is is uh, having a rough day, go search for Arrow on YouTube and just read through the comments, and uh, and it will definitely bring some uh, some some feeling of pride uh, to you. And, uh, and just finally, uh, Narissa, Narissa asked a quick question about, you know, what's next? Uh, you know, what are the next steps for moving the legacy forward? So um, the project that we're most um, focused on right now is, the, is the getting the museum up and running. So we are working with Montserrat National Trust and just, you know, figuring out, you know, what kind of partnership we can have. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, if anybody has any, you know, comments, questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us on social media. And, uh, and yeah, and you know, we'll keep we'll keep people updated as we go. So I'm excited. About, I'm excited about the the um, remix coming out next year. Yes, yes, we are too. Yes. I'd like to thank um, all of you, the panelists. Um, it's been an interesting conversation. I hope the listening audience finds it as interesting as I did. And um, I'd like to thank um, Nerissa for coordinating this. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, it, was a, it was a privilege to be on. Likewise. Take care, everyone. <laughs>